Welcome to the Assassin's Creed Timeline Part 6, Revolution. In Part 5, we join the crew of Captain Edward Kenway as he pillaged and plundered his way through the Caribbean, taking anything he pleased, eventually embracing the ways of the Assassins and dismantling a Templar plot, ending with the Assassin Shea Patrick Cormac betraying his brotherhood in the colonies and joining the Templars with Edward's own son Haytham Kenway, after unintentionally causing a disaster that killed thousands of innocent people. After hunting down his former brothers and sisters, Shay left the colonial assassins destroyed and their mentor Achilles broken and alone. With the assassins mostly gone from the colonies, Shay left to search for the precursor box still in assassin hands, and Haytham cemented the influence of the Templars in the lands of North America, as the winds of change were getting ready to blow. England controlled the colonies, and the lower parts of Louisiana were in a transitional period from French to Spanish control. With events on the horizon that would change the shape of the colonies, two children from different worlds would soon find their destinies leading to the Assassin Brotherhood. Before the time of Shay's betrayal of the Brotherhood, a girl named named Aveline de Grand Prix was born in New Orleans in the year 1747 to a wealthy French merchant named Philippe de Grand Prix and his former slave called Jean. Philippe eventually left her for a woman named Madeline who was secretly a master Templar of the Louisiana Templars and Jean was allowed to stay at the house and became a servant once again while she raised her daughter. At some point Aveline's mother had stolen an artifact belonging to the assassins and she became fearful that they would come after her and her daughter. Leaving the artifact inside a locket she gave her, Jean fled New Orleans with the help of Madeline's contacts, being transported to a slave work site in Mexico, where Mayan ruins were believed to hold Isu artifacts, and Madeline became Aveline's stepmother, attempting to raise her with Templar ideals. Aveline grew up having recurring nightmares of her mother's disappearance, having no idea what happened to her. And as she grew older, she saw many injustices happening all over Louisiana due to slaves being constantly imported and forced into hard labor. And the young girl decided to take action in 1759, attempting to free a slave, but was attacked by sailors employed by the slave's owner. The African assassin and mentor of the Louisiana Brotherhood, Agate, found Aveline being attacked, rescuing her and the slave and Agate saw her desire for justice and took her in as an assassin trainee. After a few months of intense training, she was officially inducted into the Assassin Brotherhood. From that point on, Aveline was Agate's agent in Louisiana, sending her on missions to help people in need and rid the area of the Templars, using her cover as the illustrious daughter of a wealthy landowner and her ability to blend in with the local slaves to the advantage of the Brotherhood, leading to the events of Assassin's Creed Liberation, beginning in the year 1765. But over in the colonies in the year 1760, the son of Haytham Kenway, Rado Hangato, was being raised by his mother Zio in a village occupied by the Native American Mohawk tribe. Although he was half British, he was being raised no different than the other boys of the tribe, learning to hunt and playing in the woods with his friends. Haytham was completely unaware he even had a son, as Zio had left him at some point shortly after finding out about his Templar roots. While playing in the woods, he ran into his father's Templar associates and was attacked by one of the more sadistic men in the group vicious man named Charles Lee, who hated the Native Americans that he considered to be below him. Too. <laughs> Only tell us where your village is, boy, and you can go. You are nothing, a speck of dust. You and all your ill, living in the dirt like animals, oblivious to the true ways of the world. What is your name? Charles Lee. Why do you ask? So I can find you. After waking up, he found his village on fire as the rest of the Mohawk tribe was escaping, as he desperately began searching for his mother, finding her trap. <laughs> Yeah, 
Brad Ohengado grew up with close friends at his side, but without his mother to guide him, becoming extremely weary of the colonists settling the land near them, and concerned that eventually his tribe would be attacked again, or pushed out of their homes. In the year 1769, after killing several Templars, Aveline had discovered her mother's whereabouts and traveled to the Isu ruins in Mexico, where she had been sent to work, and traveled through the ruins the Templars were obsessed with, finding half of an artifact called a prophecy disc, which could record audio and video messages, preventing the artifact from falling into Templar hands. After escaping the collapsing ruins, Aveline found her mother, and the two were reunited once again. But it was no heartwarming reunion. Jean demanded that her daughter return home for her own safety, and made her promise not to give the artifact to her mentor Agate, worried that this power should not fall into assassin hands. And Aveline returned to Louisiana, but eventually she would make her way back, making peace with her mother, and obtaining the second half of the prophecy disc, and a map leading to another Isu temple. While Aveline worked to solve the mystery of this prophecy disc and why the Templars were after it, in the Mohawk village, Atham's young son discovered a crystal ball being protected by the village elder. The crystal ball was actually a piece of Eden that allowed wielders to speak across the centuries, folding time and place, and allowing Juno, still trapped inside the Grand Temple after thousands of years, to communicate with Connor across the ages. Knowing he would be crucial to the events of the future, Juno tasked him with protecting the entrance to the Grand Temple, ensuring it would be found in the future undisturbed. Connor, believing this was some sort of spirit revealing his destiny, agreed, and Juno told him to find a man that can teach him what he needed to know, burning the symbol of the Assassin Brotherhood in his mind, leading to the year 1769 and the events of Assassin's Creed III. Rado Hangado began his quest and eventually found the homestead of Achilles Davenport, the disgraced member of the Colonial Assassins, now an older, bitter man, wanting nothing to do with the Brotherhood. What? Um, I, I was told you could train me. No. Go away. I'm not leaving. Just hear me out. What are you so afraid of? Afraid? You think I'm afraid of anything? Least of all a self-important little scab like you? Ah. Oh, you might dream of being a hero, of riding to rescues, of saving the world. But stay this course, and the only thing you're gonna be is dead. Never forget what has happened here. I won't. The world's moved on, boy. The best you do, too. The young man was determined to learn from Achilles to keep his village safe and refused to leave the homestead. And after being attacked by robbers, Achilles saved the boy and decided to let him inside the house, teaching him the history of the Brotherhood and the mysteries of the so-called spirit that he had seen. The spirit said that, that I am... spirits of yours have been harassing the assassins for centuries, ever since Ezio uncorked the bottle. Uh, but you don't even know what an assassin is, do you? Well, best settled in then. I've got a story to tell, and it's gonna take a while to get it all out. After agreeing to train the boy, Achilles showed him the Templars that were in control of the area, instantly recognizing Charles Lee from his childhood and his father's name. I have seen what is to come if they succeed. They have to die, don't they? All of them. Even my father. Especially your father. He's the one holding the whole thing together. Connor spent years training with Achilles, learning to fight, history and philosophy, the ways of the assassin order and the structure of the Templars. Connor was so dedicated with a fierce sense of duty that he excelled in every aspect of his studies, but knew there was still much to learn. He also assisted the old man into town to buy supplies and helped him maintain the homestead. And Achilles, due to his name being difficult to pronounce and to protect him, decided to rename him after his own late son Connor, addressing him from now on as Connor Kenway. Your skin is fair enough that you might pass for one with uh, Spanish or Italian blood. Better to be thought a Spaniard than a native. And both are better still than I. 
That is not true. What's true and what is aren't always the same. What would you call me then? Kana. Yes, that will be your name. All right then, off you go. Over years of continued training, Connor met allies that would help Achilles restore the homestead and helped an old friend of the mentor and ally of the assassins, Robert Faulkner, rebuild an old ship called the Aquila. And Connor learned how to sail and command a ship with a crew, like his grandfather Edward Kenway before him. After returning to the homestead, Connor had earned the right to wear Achilles' assassin robes and officially became the first assassin of the reborn colonial brotherhood. By the year 1773, Connor had become a strong young man, and his best friend, Kanandoko, came to visit him, warning him that their land was being sold and the villagers had to leave their homes. Outraged with this injustice, Connor decided it was time to begin his mission and went to war. What have you done? When my people go to war, a hatchet is buried into a post to signify its start. When the threat has ended, the hatchet is removed. <sighs> You could have used a tree. In the colonies, tension between the Templar-supported British and the colonists were reaching an all-time high, and war was getting ready to break out, as the British soldiers harassed the local populace with higher taxes and unnecessary force. On December 16th, Connor participated in the historical Boston Tea Party, dumping British shipments of tea into the Boston Harbor in defiance of British authority, alongside colonial dissidents such as William Molyneux and Paul Revere, inspiring the local crowd to protest as the Templars looked on quietly furious. We saved the last one for you. A year later, in 1774, the Templar William Johnson returned to the Mohawk village in another attempt to forcibly purchase their land, and Connor made him pay the ultimate price for his greed. After helping several members of the Sons of Liberty, a group of colonists dedicated to standing against the British and fighting for colonial independence, Connor unintentionally found himself allied with them, having the same goals in mind, and was considered by them to be one of the group. The colonists had begun forming a militia of their own against the British, expecting war to break out at any moment. And in April of 1775, the first shots were fired in Lexington and Concord. The American Revolution had begun. Return fire! Return fire! Go! Hold fire! Go! Wait for my signal. Fire now! Fall back! Fall back! We did it! The turning tail! Takes a true monster to do something like this. Many who should have died today now live because of you. And what of them? We do the best we can with what we've got. It is not enough. <laughs> it never is. Months later, the colonists officially formed the Continental Army, ready to fight the British, and appointed a man named George Washington as its commander-in-chief. Battle after battle was fought as the revolution took thousands of lives on both sides, and Connor assisted against the British as he rooted out the Templars. Eventually, Connor discovered a Templar plot to kill George Washington and was framed by the Order as the instigator, and jailed, being sentenced to hang, as Charles Lee finally recognized who this mystery assassin was. The child in the forest was you. I said I would find you. <laughs> and so you have. But not quite as you had expected, am I right? 
As Connor faced execution, he was rescued by Achilles and the other assassins, and struck at the Templars, escaping with his life and proving his innocence. Throughout the next year, Connor continued helping the Patriots, developing a close friendship with George Washington and the leaders of the American Revolution. And in the year 1776, he witnessed the signing of the Declaration of Independence, proclaiming the 13 colonies as the United States. Later that same year, back in Louisiana, the father of Aveline de Grand Prix was poisoned by his wife Madeline after he found evidence of her Templar dealings. And the assassin trader Shea Patrick Cormac, now an older man, had spent years tracking down the precursor box, which he had finally discovered in France, where the French Brotherhood was keeping it hidden with an assassin named Charles Dorian. Shea surprised Dorian, plunging a hidden blade deep within his body, slaying him and taking the box, as the assassin taunted Shea with the failures of the Templars. <sighs> Old Connor and his assassins. The American Revolution undid your Templar business. And perhaps we shall start a revolution of our own. Shea left to meet with his Templar associates as they plotted to plant the seeds of revolution in France. But Charles Dorian's death left behind his grieving son, now alone and afraid. The young boy, Arno Dorian, would eventually play an important role in the Assassin Order years later. The Templar Grand Master in France, Francois de la Serre, took pity on Arno and took the boy in as his own, raising him alongside his own daughter Elise, an act of kindness not expected from a Templar. In the colonies in the year 1777, Connor left Achilles temporarily as the two men disagreed on many things due to Connor's brash nature and Achilles' more careful attitude. Assassins are meant to be quiet, precise. We do not go announcing conspiracies from the rooftops to all who pass by. Who are you to lecture anyone? You locked yourself away in this crumbling heap and gave up on the Brotherhood entirely. Since the day I arrived, you've done nothing but discourage me. And on the rare occasions you've chosen to help, you've done so little, you may as well have done nothing at all. How dare you! Whose inaction allowed the Templar Order to grow so large that it now controls an entire nation? Let me tell you something, Connor. Life is not a fairy tale, and there are no happy endings. No. Not when men like you are left in charge. Shortly after this, Abilene was tracking down another Templar, meeting Connor for the first time, who she'd heard so much about in recent times. The two assassins worked together to find the Templar and succeeded, killing him in parting ways, returning to their own personal missions. Connor, are you always certain in the means and ways of the Brotherhood? I trust my own hands. Of course. Travel safely. It's the arrival that concerns me. <laughs> then you are on the right path. And Aveline discovered that her stepmother was the one who had poisoned her father and had been a Templar this entire time, tracking her down and pretending to be interested in joining the Templars in order to get close enough to strike. Why? You killed my father with your care and your tonic. Why? Because he never truly loved you? And Jeanne, my mother, you stole her child, sent her away. You kept her enslaved even after my father had freed her. I will not serve you. After Madeline's death, Aveline activated the prophecy disc with the pendant her mother had given her as a child and discovered that it contained a recording of Eve being elected as the leader of the Human Rebellion during the time of the Isu, ending the events of Assassin's Creed Liberation. Aveline returned home, continuing her fight against the Templars and helping new Assassin recruits find their way to Connor as he slowly rebuilt the Brotherhood in the colonies. In the year 1778, Connor and his father met face to face. By this point, Haytham learned about his son, and he tried desperately to get his son to understand that Templars and Assassins were different sides of the same coin. Oh, I expected naivete, but this... The Templars do not fight for the crown. We seek the same as you, boy. Freedom, justice, independence. But... Hmm? But what? Johnson, Pitcairn, Hickey, they sought to steal land. To sack towns, to murder George Washington. Johnson sought to own the land, that we might keep it safe. 
Pitcairn aimed to encourage diplomacy, which you cocked up thoroughly enough to start a goddamn war. <clears throat> Perhaps some time together might do us good. You are my son, after all, and might still be saved from your ignorance. I can kill you now, if you prefer. After his encounter with his father, Connor was left feeling that he could sway his father and perhaps stop the Assassin and Templar War by joining forces and deciding to work together with his father, learning more about how he operated and tracking down another Templar considered to be a traitor. But getting along with his father wouldn't be an easy task, as Assassin and Templar philosophies were too different to be compatible, and their two wildly different personalities constantly clashed. Marco, maybe you'll find him there? Enough of that. You did not have to kill him. Go catch up with the rest of Church's men. Infiltrate that camp of theirs and see what you can discover. And what about you? Never you mind. Just do as I ask. You could have killed me when we first met. What stayed your hand? Curiosity. I will find a guard who is off duty and take his uniform. Very well. I will wait here then. Of course you will. Oh, I'm sorry. Would you like me to come along and hold your hand, perhaps? Provide kind words of encouragement? I'm actually curious to know what your mother might have said about me. How is she, by the way? Dead. Murdered. What? I told them to give up the search for the precursor site. We were to focus on more practical pursuit. It is done. And I'm all out of forgiveness. <laughs> In 1778, Connor returned to the homestead and apologized to Achilles, sharing with him the idea that assassins and Templars could possibly unite to create a better world. Later on, Connor and Haytham met up with George Washington, and the two men discovered that Washington might not be the close friend that Connor had thought, and left them with a stern warning. And what's this? Private correspondence. Oh, of course it is. Would you like to know what it says, Connor? It seems your good friend here has just ordered an attack on your village. Although attack might be putting it mildly. We've been receiving reports of allied natives working with the British. Tell them what you did 14 years ago. That was another time. The Seven Years' War. Who did what and why must wait? My people come first. You and I are finished. Son. How long did you sit on this information or am I to believe you discovered it now? My mother's blood may stain another's hands. But Charles Lee is no less a monster, and all he does, he does by your command. A warning to you both. Choose to follow me or oppose me, and I will kill you. Connor raced to his village after cutting ties with his father and saved his people from experiencing another disaster, but was forced to kill his best friend when he attacked him for falsely believing that Connor had betrayed their village. Having had enough of the Templars and wanting to avenge his mother's death, Connor focused all of his attention on finding Charles Lee and ending him. By 1781, Connor had helped Achilles build a small community in his homestead, complete with families and a church. And although the Brotherhood was being rebuilt around the colonies due to the efforts of Connor, and the Templars were slowly being dismantled in the region, Achilles had no reason to celebrate as he was weak from old age and sickness. Wanting to end the conflict as soon as possible, Connor thought that he had tracked the location of Charles Lee hiding away in a fort as his ship attacked and he rushed inside. Being injured during the attack, Connor didn't find Charles Lee, but his own father, Haytham Kenway, once again, as father and son faced off for the last time. Uh, uh, give me Lee! Surrender, and I will spare you. Brave words. I'm about to die. You fare no better. Even when your kind appears to triumph, still we rise again. And do you know why? It's because the Order is born of a realization. We require no creed, no indoctrination by desperate old men. All we need is that the world be as it is. This is why the Templars will never be destroyed. Don't think I have any intention of caressing your cheek and saying I was wrong. I will not weep and wonder what might have been. I'm sure you understand. Still, I'm proud of you in a way. You've shown great conviction, strength, courage. 
all noble qualities. I should have killed you long ago. After the death of Haytham, the Continental Army claimed victory during the Siege of Yorktown, effectively winning the American Revolution. And shortly after, George Washington had discovered an apple of Eden, and consulted with Connor about the artifact's origins, leading us to the year 1781 and the events of the Tyranny of King Washington DLC chapter. As Connor and Washington pondered over what to do with the Apple of Eden, it tempted George Washington with its power, and detecting this temptation, the Apple gave them a vivid vision of a world where he was consumed with power, becoming the ruthless King of America, something that George Washington had fiercely fought against during the war. In this vision of an alternate world, Connor's mother was still alive, and people were suffering under the King's rule. After finding King Washington at the top of his pyramid fortress, Connor attacked him, putting an end to this nightmarish world, and now understanding the raw power of the Apple of Eden, George Washington ordered Connor to take it away from him and hide it forever, not wanting anything to do with it. Take it. Take it from me. I do not want it. Sink it into the sea. Weight it. And sink it to the bottommost reaches of the ocean. Commander Washington, might I suggest, Commander, that a republic cannot survive in a world with so many contending powers. Thank you, pardon. Elected bodies, to be sure. The war was fought for this. For this nation to prosper, for this nation to thrive, the weakness of a republic must be balanced by a powerful man at its center. A powerful man, commander, who, if, if I may be so bold, would be elevated in the eyes of the world if he were given the title of king. Sir, I believe I can answer you in complete candor. Your proposal raises the greatest mischief that can befall my country. You could not have found a person to whom your schemes are more disagreeable. Let me conjure you then. If you have any regard for your country, Concern for yourself, or posterity, or respect for me. To banish these thoughts from your mind. Never communicate, as from yourself or anyone else, the sentiment of the like nature. Continuing the events of Assassin's Creed 3, Connor returned to the homestead to find that Achilles had passed away. The man who had taught him everything he knew and cared for him like his own son was gone. I miss you as I miss my mother. I hope all is well with you, wherever you are. Goodbye, old man. Until it comes time for me to join you, then I will bother you once again. It was time to end this war and find Charles Lee, facing the Templar Master and chasing him down, injuring him. But Charles Lee survived, staggering away for one final drink knowing that this time there was no escape from the determined Connor. Six months after the death of Charles Lee, Connor returned to his village and communicated with Juno via the crystal ball once again, and she thanked Connor for protecting the area and keeping the Grand Temple secret, ordering him to hide the amulet taken from Charles Lee, the key to open the Grand Temple doors, away from Templar hands and ending the events of Assassin's Creed III. Connor lived the rest of his days as leader of the American Brotherhood of Assassins, protecting the land that thousands had died for, and making the Brotherhood stronger than ever in the region, eventually meeting a woman from another Native American tribe and having children of his own. 
In the year 1783, the Treaty of Paris was signed, formally recognizing the United States as a legitimate country, and the last remaining British troops in America were sent back home. And later, George Washington was elected as the first president of the United States of America. That same year, in Paris, the Templars, knowing of their failure in the colonies, were preparing to orchestrate a new plot to manipulate the strings of France. And the young son of the murdered assassin Charles Dorian, Arno, was now a 21-year-old man. He had spent his childhood raised by the Grand Master of the French Templars, Francois de la Serre, a man quite different from the rest of the Grand Masters of the Order. While holding strong Templar convictions, such as the need for the world to be controlled in order to avoid chaos, he treated people fairly and even befriended assassins, seeing no need for conflict. De la Serre, unaware of the Templar Shays' plan to assassinate Charles Dorian, felt great sadness for Arno and loved him as his own son, raising him in a wealthy lifestyle. As the young man grew closer, De la Serre's own daughter, Elise. One night, as an adult, Arno snuck into a party, hearing that Elise, the girl he had grown up with, was back in town after being away for a long time. one of my father's suits. <laughs> Are you wearing a dress? You don't even start. I feel like a mummy wrapped up in this thing. Must be quite an occasion to get you so fancy. It's not like that. Your father. Who's in there? Who <laughs> Go. I'll distract them. What? You're kicking me out. It's complicated. I'll explain later, but for now, out the window. This leads us to the year 1789 and the events of Assassin's Creed Unity. After sneaking out of the party, to Arno's horror, he discovered his adoptive father, De La Serre, being attacked, collapsing to his death. Monsieur! Monsieur De La Serre! Monsieur De La Serre! Sivir, come away! Guards! Help! Murder! Arno, being in the wrong place at the wrong time, was arrested and blamed for the death. In reality, a splinter group of Templars believed that De La Serre's leadership was flawed and weak, and they conspired to kill him in a coup to replace him with the Templar Grandmaster, a man named Francois Thomas Germain, who was actually Aita reborn once again, and a sage that started experiencing memories of his previous life in the first civilization. Germain believed that the Templars had grown corrupt and soft, and was previously exiled from the Order by De La Serre for having ideas that that he found too radical. After his death, Germain became the leader of the French Templars. In prison, Arno couldn't stay out of trouble and got into a fight with a man named Pierre Bellic, who realized that Arno had heightened senses like so many assassins before him. Ah. Make him bleed. Ah. Ah. My grandmother ain't harder than that. She's Belgian. Ah. Ah. Give me what's mine. And go back to your crazy drawings, old man. Drawings. Bees here. Everywhere. Scribbled like chicken scratches all over this cell. Where? where? Come here, you little piss pot. Get your hands off me. Look at the wall. What are you doing? Concentrate. Concentrate. What are they? Messages from the past. I had myself thrown into half the prisons in Paris in search of these. For the next couple of months, Bellic sparred with Arno, training the young man to fight, in the hope that the opportunity for escape would one day present itself. And it eventually did, when chaos was starting to erupt outside as the Templars, led by Germain, had been manipulating events, causing the nation to start tearing itself apart, and the two men used the opportunity to escape. The French Revolution was soon beginning. The Templars had forced famine and economic turmoil in the lives of regular, unwealthy citizens of the country, purposefully causing outrage in the hopes that it would one day explode into a full-blown revolution. The Templars had hoped that the revolution would show humanity the horrors of unrestrained free will and crave order above all else after that. As Bellic escaped, he told Arno to come find the assassins and encouraged the young man to embrace his assassin lineage. Now get up there! I can't! That's impossible! Impossible? That's the purview of every assassin boy! If you can pluck your head out of your own arts, come find us! Make a great fit. Goodbye, piss pot! You! Back away from the ledge!
As soon as he escaped, he found Elise, upset after finding out that Arno had been unwillingly involved in her father's death and revealing that she was in fact Templar also. Arno was supposed to deliver a letter warning Delisere of his impending death, but he never delivered the letter, ensuring that his adoptive father would be killed by his own order. Arno was filled with guilt and left, feeling lost, without a clear path ahead of him and his relationship with Elise in shambles. Remembering the advice given to him by Belek, Arno decided to use the clues he gave him to find the 600 year old secret headquarters of the French assassins hidden deep underneath a cathedral. The assassins had actually spotted Arno coming from far away, and Belek was already waiting for him, leading him to the inner sanctum of the assassins, where he would make the biggest decision of his life. Would he join the French Brotherhood and carry on his father's legacy? Arno wanted nothing more than to find the ones responsible for the death of Delisere, and agreed to join, and Belek was assigned as his mentor. These are the words spoken by our ancestors, the words that lay at the heart of our creed. Stay your blade from the flesh of the innocent. Hide in plain sight. Never compromise the Brotherhood. Let these tenets be branded upon your mind. Follow them and be uplifted. Break them at your peril. Rise, assassin. Arno Dorian is dead. He has been culled from this world, his sins and failures turned to dust. Tonight he is reborn, a novice of the Assassin Brotherhood. Partnering together through various assignments, the pair traveled throughout France, fighting against the Templars and learning more about their plot to destabilize the country, while Arno grew impatient, wanting to track down Delisere's killer. Over time, the young assassin's reputation grew as an impatient warrior that would bend the orders given to him by the Assassin Council. Bellic saw potential in him and agreed with his straightforward, no-nonsense attitude towards getting things done, believing that the Assassin Order had also become weak and disagreed that they should be trying to make peace with Templars. Arno quickly gained the rank of Assassin, graduating from his novice status, and was able to move about on his own hunting Templars without his teacher. Everything's in place. Finally saw Risa did he? What's our cut? 30%? Good, good. This is our moment, my friend. By the year 1791, the Templars were working efficiently to flush out any remaining Templars left over from Delisere's leadership, and Arno discovered that they were looking for Elise, worried that she would rally her old Templar associates against the new leadership. Arno raced after her and found the Templars attacking her, saving her life and attempting to convince her to let the Assassins help her. Elise stood in front of the council and pled her case, asking for help while the Assassins were horrified that a Templar was in their inner sanctum. My name is... For heaven's sake, take that blindfold off. Ridiculous. My name is Elise de la Serre. My father was Francois de la Serre, Grand Master of the Templar Order. I've come to ask for your help. Oh, here we go. You are not men with whom I would normally parlay, monsieur. But my father is dead, as are my allies within the Order. If I must turn to the assassins for my revenge, so be it. This is a trick to make us lower our guard. I say we kill her, send her head back as a warning. Belek, enough! Arno and Elise combined their skills to uncover the new Grand Master, leading the Templar Order, and in the process made an unsettling discovery. The mentor of the assassins was killed. I didn't. Of course not. But I have to report this to the Council immediately. They'll know what to do. No! They don't trust me as it is. I'll be the suspect, first and last. You're right. Of course, you're right. What are we going to do? We find out what happened. After following the trail of the killer, Arno made a discovery that would shake the very foundations of the French Brotherhood. The mentor's killer was Belek, the man who had brought him into the Order and trained him, furious that the assassins were trying to make peace with the Templars. You think it's the first time this has happened? The first time that the Assassins have been forced to purge their leadership? The first time that the Order has built itself back up from nothing to power? Masyaf, Monteregioni, the American colonies, Ming in peace 
with the enemy is called treason. <laughs> Belek, please, come back to the council with me. We can resolve this like reasonable men. Reasonable men don't treat with Templars, boy. You're a stubborn little fuck, aren't you? put entire villages to the sword just for the chance of killing one assassin. I've seen the Grand Master of the Templar Order take in a frightened orphan and raise him as his own son. Finish it! As time passed, civil unrest was growing in France as civilians took to the streets and the assassins found themselves in the middle, trying to keep a population safe while riots broke out and anger against the wealthy elites of the country was growing. People were being executed regularly by guillotine, including the king, King Louis XVI, where the Templar Grand Master was present. After the king's death and the Grand Master's escape, Arno faced the council, tired of the assassin constantly acting of his own free will and doing as he pleased, while satisfying his personal vendettas, making a final decision on his future. Arno Dorian, you are attainted. Your rank and title are stripped from you, and you are hereby exiled from the Brotherhood of Paris. You cannot be serious. Listen, I know what Germain is doing. I can stop him! The decision of this council is final. We give you leave to go. Arno found himself stripped of his rank and thrown out of the Assassin Brotherhood, the order that he had dedicated so much of himself to, while Germain, the man ultimately responsible for Delessaire's death, was still free, and France continued to tear itself apart. Arno and Elise eventually tracked down Germain, having found an immensely powerful Sword of Eden, thanks to the memories of Aita that he had inside his head. The two faced off against the Sage, but Elise's need for revenge against the man that killed her father made her careless, and she paid with her life. killing the sage, Arno took Elise's body and buried her. Over the years, the French Revolution came to an end, and Arno eventually was given the chance to rejoin the Assassin Order, completely dedicating himself to the Brotherhood and becoming a master assassin, but a very jaded one, keeping mostly to himself after losing the love of his life, ending the events of Assassin's Creed Unity. Arno fell into a deep depression, unable to cope with the memories he had in his homeland, and traveled to the northern Paris region of Franciade to escape, and drinking away his sorrow in a local tavern, leading us to the year 1794 and the events of the DLC chapter, Assassin's Creed Unity, Dead Kings. 
In Franciad, Arnaud learned that a group of raiders led by Napoleon Bonaparte were searching for some kind of temple that held great power. A temple the local population believed was haunted with the souls of France's dead kings. Arnaud, seeing Napoleon was after this power, knew it was too dangerous to be in the hands of such an aspiring leader, and decided to find it before Napoleon could. He explored the depths of the crypts, searching for the entrance to the temple, ridding the area of these raiders, and freeing an orphan boy that they were threatening for information. A boy that supplied Arnaud with weaponry he had discovered. Where did you get that? I stole it from two raiders yesterday. Hid it here. This is a fine gun. Yes, I know. I know what I'm doing. Which is? Saving France! Now that you're here, it's gonna be a lot easier. After searching for clues among the raiders and stealing the key they found to the temple, Arno found the entrance to it. The temple held an artifact called the Head of Saint Denis. As he arrived at the artifact, he claimed it and used its powers to escape the temple as Napoleon's raiders attempted to stop him. But the power of the artifact was too great to stand against. magic is this? That Commandant must never have it. After leaving the temple unharmed, Arno realized that the head of Saint Denis was nothing more than an apple of Eden encased in the lantern, and made sure the assassins hid it well giving it to a member of the Egyptian Brotherhood to hide away in Cairo. Having learned that these artifacts were out in the world being constantly sought after by men dreaming of power, Arno was inspired to return to the Brotherhood with a newfound determination to make the world right. In the year 1799, Napoleon Bonaparte still became ruler of France, and nine years later, in 1808, in an act of responsibility to close off the events of his past, Arno traveled together with Napoleon to the temple where he had originally killed the sage. His skeletal remains were all that were left and the men, knowing he was more than a regular human, knew that his body was too dangerous to be left behind for the Templars to excavate. They took the remains of Germain and buried them within the catacombs of France, ensuring they would be unrecognizable from the countless other skeletal remains buried within. Join me next time for the Assassin's Creed Timeline Part 7, A Changing World, where we'll explore a century of history defined by war as the Templars search for another powerful Isu weapon in India, and a pair of assassin twins decide to take back London from the Templars, honoring the work of Edward Kenway, followed by the young princess of Russia, Anastasia, seeking safety in the assassins, and a conflict consumes the entire world as the Templar Order sheds their identity for the third time in history.